All right, for this lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, skin color, and where it comes from and why it happens. It's not just decorative. Skin color is there for a reason, for several reasons, uh, that physiologically affect your body and that um, can provide clinical clues and clinical significance. So first off, what are the things that cause your skin to have color? Uh, there are many factors. By and large, the largest is melanin. Melanin is the pigment uh, that is produced by cells called melanocytes that you've heard me talk about before. And uh, it is like the pigment that your body specifically produces to give your skin color. It's the one that is responsible for most of what we think of as skin color. There are two varieties of melanin. Eumelanin, uh, which is brownish black, and pheomelanin, which is reddish yellow. Uh, how much of each of these you produce is the major component of your skin tone. So, uh, if you are an individual with brown to black skin, then you produce lots of eumelanin. If, um, as is, is common in people of Asian descent, uh, your skin tone is more, um, it's still dark, it's still colored, but it's more, um, you know, yellowish, reddish, then you're producing lots of pheomelanin. Um, if you are of uh, what, what would normally be termed white, uh, then you probably don't produce very much of either, at least naturally. Um, as we will see, environment plays a huge role in the amount of melanin that you produce and its distribution. Uh, but these are sort of what your melanocytes are tuned to produce from, uh, from birth. Uh, blood, next. So blood is colored. It is reddish-ish. And uh, blood, uh, the face is highly permeated with blood vessels. In fact, all of the skin is highly permeated with blood vessels. And if you have more blood going to your skin, it gives your skin a reddish tone, um, whereas lack of blood will usually uh, cause your skin to whiten or go pale. Uh, blood changes color due to oxygen content. So blood that is poorer in oxygen content tends to be more of a blue color, more of a purple blue color whereas uh, highly oxygenated blood is a more rich crimson red, and that can have clinical significance. Third, carotene. Uh, carotene is the pigment that makes um, carrots and egg yolks uh, orange or yellow. Right, so it's this orangish yellow pigment. It's uh, actually a useful precursor in uh, making certain vitamins, uh, vitamin A, things like that. Um, it is a fat soluble vitamin and it is found in keratinocytes. The more keratin, keratin, not keratin, it's a totally different thing that just happens to sound similar. The more keratin that you eat, the more it tends to accumulate, particularly in fat and keratinocytes. This is why fat sometimes looks kind of yellowish. It's the keratin in it. Uh, and uh, it, if it builds up in your keratinocytes, then your skin has a more yellow tone. Uh, there are some people who, I mean, this isn't necessarily unhealthy, um, but people who eat a lot of orange vegetables, such as yams and carrots, will actually accumulate a orange skin tone to their body. 
Um, this is much, going to be much more visible if you have light skin than if you have dark skin. And uh, people who have problems with carotene metabolism that cause it to build up can also have this issue. So those are the three things that are primarily going to affect like skin tone all over your body. But there are several things that can affect skin tone over specific parts of your body. Um, so uh, freckles and moles. Freckles and moles are uh, parts of your skin um, that have excessive melanin in them. Um, usually tan to black, uh, depending upon whether you're producing more pheomelanin or eumelanin. And uh, freckles are flat, melanocyzed patches. They usually result from melanocytes that have a more limited range in how they can distribute melanin. Melanocytes produce melanin, but they don't keep it all to themselves. They actually uh, put out like these tendrils and they deposit melanin in nearby cells. Um, and the range that they can reach out and, uh, uh, and deposit melanin is going to determine whether or not you freckle. Uh, if your melanocytes have little weak dimply arms that can't reach very far, then as you get sunlight, you will tend to freckle. Um, the areas around your melanocytes will get dark, but the in-between areas won't. If you have melanocytes that have long arms with long reach, or if you have just a higher density of melanocytes, then uh, they'll be able to reach all of the keratinocytes in your skin. Your skin will tan evenly. Uh, moles, or nevi, are... Um, elevated melanized patches, usually with hair. Uh, and these are um, typically, uh, they are not cancerous, but they are precancerous lesions. Um, they are melanocytes that begin sort of replicating and depositing melanin at an enhanced rate and uh, moles can become cancerous they're sort of like they've taken a couple of steps down that pathway doesn't mean that they will become cancerous but it does mean that you kind of need to watch out for it and we'll talk about that a little bit more later um, but they're basically a bunch of melanocytes lumped together um, that are uh, producing lots and lots of melanin, so they usually turn out kind of dark. Uh, last, we have hemangiomas, uh, which are a type of birthmark. Uh, these types of birthmarks are sometimes called port wine stains. Um, they are, they look like a big kind of patch of darkened skin, usually uh, with irregular features, often on the legs or on the face. Um, these are actually caused by benign tumors of dermal capillaries. So uh, they're usually something that happens during development. And when we say benign tumors, what we mean is excessive growth of dermal capillaries that is non-cancerous in nature. That it's not spreading, it's not necessarily growing, but it grew out of control for a while. And so those areas simply have a lot more blood flowing to them. Capillaries are pigmented, uh, usually because of blood. Uh, and so they end up being this dark patch. Sometimes they disappear in childhood. You like outgrow them or you remodel them and the uh, the, you know, the capillaries fade and go away. Uh, sometimes they persist throughout adulthood. Uh, it just is kind of random. So here's to show you an example of skin color. Here we have uh, skin from a very light-skinned individual. 
and here we have skin from a very dark skinned individual, well, moderately dark skinned individual. And uh, so you see that the skin is darkest in the stratum basale. This is where the uh, melanocytes are, and the melanocytes reach out and deposit melanin granules into nearby cells. As those cells age through the epidermis, they move upwards carrying uh, their melan uh, melanized granules with them, uh, eventually becoming part of the uh, stratum corneum where they die, but they keep their melanized uh, particles when they die uh, and eventually flake off. So if you have naturally dark skin, your melanocytes are always uh, uh, producing a higher level of melanin or uh, distributing that melanin more evenly, then uh, you're going to constantly producing darker keratinocytes with more melanin granules that will constantly age upwards and you'll have a relatively even skin tone. If you're light skinned, that typically means that your uh, melanocytes are not as active, they don't produce as much melanin, they don't distribute it to as wide an area. Um, however, if you tan, if you are exposed to UV light, then they will become more active. So let's say you go for a tanning session, um, you're going to get more melanin spread around the stratum basale, it'll age up, and then it'll eventually flake off in your stratum corneum. So that tanning event will only be present for basically one life cycle of keratinocytes. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the number of melanocytes that you have is set by genetics and is pretty even throughout the population. So it isn't that dark-skinned people have more melanocytes and light-skinned people have less melanocytes. Um, it's pretty even and whether you have more or less does not seem to necessarily correspond to whether you have darker skin or lighter skin. The differences are in how your melanocytes function. In dark-skinned people, uh, you produce greater quantities of melanin, uh, so you just produce more. You break down the melanin more slowly, so it builds up over time. Uh, you spread the uh, melanin granules more evenly. Uh, if melanin granules are all built up in like a few cells, then they're not very effective at producing color. The more evenly spread they are in the surrounding keratinocytes, the more that color sort of shows through. Uh, in addition, um, the melanized cells can be seen more clearly through the epidermis, and you produce different ratios of eumelanin to pheomelanin. Eumelanin is usually considered darker than pheomelanin. So if you are a dark-skinned individual, um, you probably produce more eumelanin and less pheomelanin. Lighter-skinned people uh, usually have less distribution of the melanin. It stays clumped near the keratinocyte nucleus rather than spread out through the cell. So it's less effective at actually producing visible color. Um, and uh, it tends to fade from keratinocytes faster. So most of the melanin is, uh, is in the stratum basale, and as cells age through uh, their life cycle, they drop off that melanin or they degrade that melanin, and it doesn't build up over time so that um, it, uh, by the time it reaches the stratum corneum, the melanin is mostly gone. Uh, and in that case, uh, in the case of sort of medium-toned individuals, particularly people of uh, Asian descent, then uh, they may produce a lot of melanin, but it may be pheomelanin instead. 
Um, in the case of uh, light-toned individuals, say, you know, Scandiwegians or whatnot, uh, they may produce very little melanin and degrade it very quickly, and it just doesn't build up in their cells. And if you are light-skinned, probably the melanin that you produce is pheomelanin rather than eumelanin. Um, the sort of more Mediterranean, olive skin-toned people, people of Spanish and Italian descent, um, may not produce a whole lot of melanin, but the melanin that they produce is going to have a higher ratio of eumelanin to pheomelanin in it. Uh, in addition, all of this is interfaced with uh, the environment. The function of melanin is to block UV light. Ultraviolet light is capable of causing mutations. It doesn't have much penetration value, so it mostly only causes mutation in the cells of the skin, uh, but it is capable of causing that mutation. That having been said, UV light is also essential to uh, the process of making vitamin D. Uh, this is a natural process that happens in your skin. There isn't a specific cell that does it, um, but you have uh, effectively vitamin D precursor in your skin and uh, UV light provides the right amount and type of energy to change it into uh, vitamin D1, um, which happens only if you get exposure to UV light in your skin. Uh, warming and the warming effect of the sun actually causes it to then convert into a more advanced form of vitamin D, and then that vitamin D goes to um, your liver and your kidneys, where it is converted further into uh, uh, calcitriol, which is a hormone that we will talk about later on in bone development, but it's extremely important in regulating calcium levels. So people need to have UV light exposure. But too much UV light exposure can cause damage. This is sort of a, 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 a three little bears scenario, right? This is, uh, or a Goldilocks scenario, right? This is too much, this is too little, this is just light, just right. And how much melanin you need is going to depend on where you live. If you live in a place where you get lots of sun exposure and it's direct sun exposure with lots of UV light, then you're getting plenty of UV light. You need to block some of it out. This is why people who tend to live in like desert or equatorial environments tend to have darker skin, historically speaking. The populations who live there develop darker skin genetically as a defense mechanism against the high levels of UV light. Uh, on the other hand, if you are living in, you know, Norway, where it's dark four months out of the year, and where you get very indirect light most of the time, and you're wearing a lot of clothes, you don't want to block off that UV light, because you need some of it to produce vitamin D, uh, which will allow you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulate your calcium levels. So people who tend to live in very cold northern climates with indirect sunlight, lots of cloud cover, have lighter skin, again, historically and genetically. But your body can actually change to adapt to its environment. So if you take somebody with light skin and you put them in a situation where they get lots of exposure to UV light, it will stimulate the melanin, uh, the melanocytes to produce more melanin and their skin will start to darken. This is what we call a suntan. Uh, similarly, if you take somebody with dark skin and you put them in an environment where they get zero or very little UV light exposure, their skin will tend to fade. Now, um, it's easier to make more melanin than to make less melanin. So tanning tends to be a more effective mechanism than untanning. Like if you have naturally dark skin, 
then there is a certain threshold beyond which your skin will no longer fade any light. And it's also actually true that if you have naturally light skin, if you're like of, of Irish descent or Scandinavian descent, there's a limit to how much you will tan. Um, you will tend to just burn and then your skin peels off. And even if you're tanning very carefully, you're never going to get that dark. So the environmental uh, exposure can kind of move you one direction or the other, but somewhat less dramatically. Skin color can tell you a lot about a patient. Uh, there are several skin colors of diagnostic significance. First off, uh, cyanosis. Cyanosis is a bluing of the skin, particularly around the lips and the fingertips. The fingertips and toes because they're furthest from your heart. Lips because the skin is very, very thin there and very easy to see. Uh, this is a sign of oxygen deficiency. Uh, we said that blood changes color to a sort of bluer color when it's oxygen deprived. So if you see a bluing of the lips uh, and the fingers and toes and the extremities, uh, that usually indicates that the patient is not getting sufficient oxygen. Urethremia is the opposite. It's a reddening of the skin. Um, not like a rash, but like a flush or a blush. This usually increase, uh, it indicates increased blood flow, usually not increased oxygenation, because under normal circumstances, your blood should be very close to as oxygenated as it can get. Um, so redness typically means increased blood flow. Um, it can be, uh, it, it can indicate emotional disturbance, uh, as in a blush or a flush. It can indicate um, fatigue, exercise, hyperthermia, um, that the blood is being brought to the skin surface because of increased heat, uh, fever, um, and inflammation. Pallor. Pallor is paleness due to decreased blood flow to the skin. Uh, it can be a sign of shock, uh, which is a dramatic drop in blood pressure. Um, it can be a result of, uh, uh, of a uh, of blood loss. You just lost blood. Um, certain diseases, which can cause... Uh, toxic shock or endotoxic shock uh, that can cause your blood vessels to dilate, pulling uh, blood away from the skin, or it can be a sign of just a sudden coldness, right? When you get cold, then your body pulls blood inwards. So you have to look at Pollard in its context. Somebody who has just stepped out into the cold winter air, uh, pallor is normal. If you have pallor and you're in a nice warm room, then that might be something of greater chemical, clinical significance. Albinism is a uh, genetic disorder where you lack the enzyme to make melanin. So people with albinism have skin that has zero melanin in it. So their skin is like milky white. All of the color in their skin is going to come from uh, the carotene and uh, blood, which so it's usually totally white. Um, hair, uh, the color of your hair is also due to melanin, so their hair will usually be not just blonde, but like actually white. And they typically have blue-gray eyes. There are several things that go into uh, eye color but like the black or brown color of your eyes is due to melanin. So if you don't have melanin, then you will tend to have blue or gray eyes. Jaundice. Uh, jaundice is a yellowing of the skin. It is usually caused by a buildup of bilirubin, 
Uh, bilirubin is a protein metabolism byproduct, uh, specifically a, uh, a, a byproduct of the breakdown of hemoglobin from dead blood cells. Uh, bilirubin is usually processed by your liver uh, so and, and then eliminated in your uh, urine or your feces. So if your liver is compromised for some reason, then it will be less uh, good at processing bilirubin. The bilirubin builds up in the blood. Some of that basically accumulates in the skin and the skin begins to yellow because bilirubin has a yellow brownish color. Uh, so Billy Ru or, uh, jaundice is often a sign of liver disease uh, or some sort of lack of liver function. It can also be a sign of blood disease uh, because your liver can be functioning fine but if you dump a bunch of dead red blood cells on it at once it's sort of like your inbox fills up. Well it's going to take you a while to work through it. Uh, that form of jaundice is usually less important. Um, give it time and your liver will eventually work through it. So if jaundice goes away in like a few days, then it was probably due to some sort of, you know, temporary blood thing. If the jaundice persists over time, then it is likely a sign of compromised liver function. Uh, last, we have... Uh, hematoma. Uh, hematoma is a fancy term for a blood clot underneath the skin, uh, and that basically means bruising. So we've all seen, probably all had bruises. It turns sort of black and blue underneath the skin. Um, typically speaking, uh, a hematoma will discolor the skin until the area is repaired, which should take ideally less than a, uh, a week, although in older people it can last longer. Um, if a bruise persists for an extended period of time, that can be a sign of a problem with the blood clotting system or a problem with the healing system it should probably be looked at. So skin markings also have clinical significance. Um, Nevi uh, moles are chronic lesions of the skin. By definition, nevi are benign. However, it is possible for them to become malignant. So here we see a benign mole, and here we see a malignant melanoma. This person quite likely going to die. Uh, a melanoma patch that's the size of a dime indicates that it's probably also already metastasized and uh, they're particularly difficult to treat. Um, usually with melanomas, the earlier you catch them, the better. So you gotta keep an eye out on these moles and look for specific things. Specifically, what are you going to be looking for? So melanoma, the, the diagnostic conditions of melanoma can be uh, remembered with the acronym A, B, C, D, E. A is for asymmetry. A benign mole should be circular. A melanoma grows randomly. So it will not be a symmetric circle. It will have different looks to each side. B stands for border. So you, a uh, mole should have a smooth circular border. Here we can see that the border is wavy. A wavy border uh, usually indicates that it is spreading and therefore potentially cancerous. C stands for color. Uh, and specifically unevenness of color. A, uh, a mole should have a single 
color that's uniform throughout. Some of them are going to be darker, some of them are going to be lighter, but they should all be the same color. Here you can see we have a dark patch here, it's lighter here, darker here, lighter here, darker here, kind of medium over here. It's not a uniform color. D stands for diameter. Um, generally speaking, uh, a mole should stay the same size and should not increase or decrease its diameter. If you see the diameter changing, it growing or something like that, that could indicate that what you're looking at is a melanoma or is becoming a melanoma. Um, and also moles should be of limited di diameter. Usually mel uh, melanomas, uh, if you have something that's like really, really big, it could potentially be becoming a melanoma. And E is evolving. Moles should be stable over time. Uh, they should continue to look like they look, and they shouldn't change. If your mole is changing shapes, changing sizes, changing colors, anything like that, that indicates that it may be becoming a melanoma. Melanomas are caused by uh, mutations in melanocytes. Uh, remember that melanocytes respond to UV uh, damage. So they actually, the way they can tell that you're being exposed to UV is they accumulate mutations, right? They get DNA damage. And they respond to that damage by producing more melanin to block off the DNA, or to block off the UV, until they stop getting damaged. That means that in order for melanocytes to work, they have to be damaged. That makes them particularly vulnerable to UV damage. Like, they're constantly getting damaged in order to work. Some of that damage could potentially cause them to become cancerous. Melanomas are actually the rarest form of skin cancer, but they are also the most dangerous. Uh, other forms of skin cancer uh, usually do not spread very easily. Uh, but melanocytes, by their nature, put out these spreading tendrils. So when a melanocyte begins to become cancerous, it spreads very easy, and it's actually the spreading that causes cancer to be dangerous. All right. So to remind you for this lecture, you need to know um, the causes of skin color, melanin, carotene, blood. You need to know the two types of melanin, eumelanin versus pheomelanin, and what makes them different, what makes them similar. Uh, you need to know what is going to contribute to a natural tendency to produce darker skin, producing more melanin, producing more eumelanin relative to pheomelanin, spreading out that uh, uh, that melanin more evenly um, and uh, not keeping it bunched up towards the nucleus. Uh, you need to know the clinical significance of skin color. So you need to know what pallor, urethremia, uh, jaundice, albinism, uh, things like that, what all of those mean, and you should be able to recognize those if I give you like a patient situation. Uh, and you need to know what a melanoma is and the ABCs of diagnosing a melanoma.